Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It is Monday, April 15th, Jackie Robinson Day, Tax Day, Earth Day, a lot of days actually, but Jackie Robinson Day, the one we are excited about from a baseball perspective, of course. On this episode, we're going to dig into some news and notes from the weekend. We're going to look at what's been happening to some of the starting pitchers with top end velocity on the injury front because the conversation around fantasy baseball right now is maybe we should be more careful with these guys given what's happening on the health front we'll dig into whether or not that's actually a good idea we're also going to take a look at where the money went over the course of the weekend weekly leagues ran fab again on sunday night and then we're going to talk a lot about some of the curious drops and some of the most difficult holds right now because as people have probably noticed there's not exactly an abundance of pitching available right now so you know you consider that there's not a lot to go get and you got a few guys that you really liked who've had a difficult start to the season. You have to balance whether or not you actually want to cut those players and roll the dice on someone you're not sure about, right? So we'll dig into some of those interesting names as well. Discord up and running. It's been that way for about two months now. Get the link in the show description. You can jump in, answer questions like the reverse mailbag question that I posted before today's show, right? We want to know uh, who is actually of interest that has been cut in a lot of leagues. So always trying to make the show as interactive as possible with that. Uh, Eno, how was your weekend? It was good. It was good. We we've, we've had some uh, some nice weather and um, and then it it went south a little bit on Saturday, and so we got uh, two baseball games, two little league games canceled, mm. which was okay. Because I had a lot of taxes to do. So the reason why this weekend was good is because it's over and taxes are filed, I guess. <laughs> Did you win? Uh, I squeaked <laughs> by. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, that's that's good enough. That's all you need. Uh, it's similar situation here. Got hot. Got up in the 80s, but uh, got outside a couple times. Got some family time in. Got the pickups done, got the taxes done, it's as much as you can ask for in the middle of April. Uh, as I mentioned up top, it is Jackie Robinson Day. You'll see 42s on the backs of all big league players in action on a Monday. And I've found that in recent years, you know, the thing I like most about Jackie Robinson Day is reading the things we haven't read before, right? Seeing things that we haven't necessarily seen before. Um, Shakia Taylor, Curly Fro on Twitter had a great column in the Chicago Tribune today that covered a lot of ground and had a really surprising nugget in it. Neither the White Sox nor the Cubs have an American-born black player on their roster right now, which is just kind of baffling. Um, year over year, there's a study it's done by the Institute for Diversity and Ethics in Sport. It's out of Central Florida. And they found that black players represented just 6.2% of players on opening day rosters down from the previous low of 7.2% that was in 2022. So it's just one of those things that like Shakia's column looked at some of the things that are changing at lower levels, trying to increase participation among young black athletes. And it's, it's one of those things that's changing over time, but it's not going to happen overnight. Uh, but I just couldn't believe that neither the Cubs nor the White Sox had an American born black player on their roster. It never, never even occurred to me. Yeah. Less than half the national rate. Um, and there's no real easy answer for why it is uh, the way it is. I mean, I think there's a lot of answers. When we had, you know, Kyler Murray having the choice between football and bass and baseball in front of us, it was pretty obvious which sport he was going to pick. I mean, <laughs> he was going to get drafted and in football. He's going to make money right away and playing the big leagues right away. Uh, versus baseball, which you get drafted and you work hard in the minor leagues for three, four years, and then maybe you make the big league. So there's that aspect to it. Then there's just, uh, you know, popularity in the media, popularity across all sports. You know, some of it is just going to be where are you looking as a kid? What are you looking at? Who are you? Who are you? you know, idolizing? Who do you want to be like? You know, um, and so there is a little bit of that. If there is a little bit of that. If you can see it, you can be it. Um, you know, we have we do have some superstars like Mookie Betts that can provide that kind of role model. 
but what if you're not a Dodgers fan? And, you know, there should be kind of one per team that could kind of uh, give you that uh, that role model. So, um, yeah, I think it's a, it's an interesting issue. Uh, I think that there's also some socioeconomic uh, parts to it. I don't know. I haven't had to kind of go through all the sports you know, kind of the kids mostly gravitate towards baseball. We've done a little bit of soccer. But um, in terms of expense, I would say that baseball has to be one of the more expensive ones. Maybe football. There's a lot of equipment in football. Um, and the, 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 the parks are pretty big. Um, it's kind of hard to have a pickup football game in the same way that it's hard to have a pickup baseball game. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, at least with all the equipment, uh, baseball and football both have, of course, their pickup versions that you can play. This is why I've heard apparently that, um, uh, that flag football has a real future. Hmm. Um, you know, it's, it was chosen, uh, for the Olympics, um, you know, because it has less of the sort of, uh, fewer of the ramifications for your brain. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, there's, it's also the pickup version of the sport, you know? But there's a lot of different reasons, um, and I think they're all tied together. Um, I, I had a little fun just looking at Jackie Robinson's Fangraphs page. It's like, you know, <laughs> how I see the world, I guess. Um, <laughs> one thing, a couple of things popped out to me, which is I love players that, you know, walk twice as much as they strike out. Like, there's not very many of those in the big leagues. And that is uh, one of the things that Robinson did. And of course that allowed him to have the 313 um, batting average for his career and a 410 on base percentage for his career. But one thing that is, that does also stick out. That's a little bit sad is that um, he didn't make the major leagues until he was 28. And I'm sure that has to do with, the whole backstory, you know, I'm sure that has to do with the segregation of baseball. Um, and, but in the end, that means that we had, you know, three, four, five of his peak years stolen from us in terms of what he could have done. Uh, you know, he's, he hit 141 homers and stole 200 bases. And, you know, with, you know, four or five more peak seasons, he could have had, you know, 200 homers, 300 stolen bases, um, and just that pristine line. He could have even pushed the average and the OBP and the slugging further. So um, he could have had a season for the ages. Although I will say 1949 for the Brooklyn Dodgers, 342 average, 432 on base percentage, 16 homers, 37 stolen bases, 122 runs, and 124 RBIs. That is a season for the ages from Jackie Robinson. Yeah. Yeah, just a remarkable player, of course. And uh, the, the K rate being that low <laughs> was like you just don't you don't see it now because the, the game is a little different in terms of mm-hmm. how people approach it, the tolerance for strikeouts. But even still, to be that good at making contact, having that power, having that speed, spraying the ball over the field, just awesome to see that. It, it jumps off the page when you look at Jackie Robinson's player page. Lots of ground to cover today. A lot of injuries from the weekend. So some good news. we got some players coming back, which we need as well. Bobby Miller will start on the negative side. Bobby Miller is on the IL with shoulder inflammation. No structural damage revealed by an MRI. So maybe we're avoiding a major problem. But I think the, the bigger question with Miller drives back to something I talked about at the very top of the show is, are we really going to go to this place as a group where we're starting to be more skeptical of guys that sit at the higher end of the range for velo, especially among starters. Do we think there is anything to the idea that this group of pitchers is more likely to break since they are generally going to be sitting a lot closer to their max on a regular basis? Yeah. I mean, there's uh, there's research just that d- direct that, that velocity is a direct stress around the elbow. So you don't even have to go into uh, the max and, and how close they're sitting to the max to find some truth already in terms of what's out there in terms of peer review research. And if you look at this chart, the easy chart that I made, just you can you can go on any site and do this. So this is a little bit early in the season. On the left, you'll see just uh, fastball velocity last year, minimum 90 innings. Um, and I had X'd out all the people that were hurt. So Sandy Al- Alcantara, Yuri Perez, Spencer Strider, Shohei Otani, Shane McClanahan, Garrett Cole. That is six out of the top 10 in fastball velocity. The remaining guys 
are Bobby Miller, who is number one, now hurt. Hunter Green, who has had TJ already. Grayson Rodriguez at fifth, uh, who has uh, had some injury history. And Jesus Cesardo, who's had some in- injury history. Um, so six out of the ten, uh, if you just went by straight velocity. Although, you know, over the course of the season, won't you get – what if we get really good seasons from Grayson Rodriguez and still a good season from Bobby Miller after he comes back? What's it worth to avoid the six that got hurt? Uh, what about the two that have excellent seasons? You know, uh, so that's that's one way to think about it. Another way to think about it here is a, uh, from John Legaza. Um, we've got um, how close they are to their max, and that's this year. So uh, we can't sort of we don't have last year to look at who got hurt last year. There's all the names that we want are on this list. All the names that we've been like talking about picking up that we're interested in. Jose, uh, Jose Soriano is number one in closeness to his max. Ben Brown is three. Bobby Miller is four. Mackenzie Gore with his nice new velo is five. Luzardo is six. Louis Varland, who you know has been showing up on some of our lists, is seven. Yariel Rodriguez is on there. Jordan Hicks. Luis Severino. Uh, these are all guys, you know, Keaton Wynn, Cole Reagans, Hunter Green, Tyler McGill. They're all on this list, and they're all under 2, 2.3 or under uh, in terms of the difference between their fastball velocity and their max. Um, league league average across everything is 3.2, um, and, uh, you know, that's sort of where Glenn Fleisick, uh from the a- ASMI uh, who has pioneered this research about the stress on being close to your max? He sort of talking talks about three and and in wanting to be closer to four. Hmm. So these guys are at two basically and lower. And um, if you annotate that list, Jose Soriano had TJ in 2021. Ben Brown had TJ in 2019. Mackenzie Gore uh, missed a lot of time in 22. Lazardo had TJ in 16. Hicks had TJ in 19, Severino had TJ, Ryan Weathers had TJ, Hunter Green had TJ, Keaton Wynn had TJ, Cole Reagans had two TJs. Uh, so annotating this list also kind of has the same effect as annotating the other list. So the only problem is there's not a really easy way to kind of look up closeness to your max. Yeah. Yeah, that is kind of strange. You don't see max pitch velo on leaderboards anywhere just yet so you have uh, to and i even on places just where the data is you have to go over to brooks you know brooks has max a uh, max pitch below i haven't really seen it anywhere else yeah i'll have to put some kind of spreadsheet together to track that better myself i hey i'm glad brooks has it at least i needed i needed one easy to find location so but like like i've just named not only uh, like 10 of the best you know starting pitchers going into the season you know, by just straight velocity, but then by closeness to max, I just named like all of our favorite sleepers. Right. So you're just not going to draft those guys anymore. Is that the what, what am I? Is that the corrective <laughs> action? And then you know, uh, you know, because we're working on this, uh, Jeb Zimmerman's working on this, and you know, I'm talking to him about it. You know, let's say you're like, oh, okay, well, I'll just take the the guys who don't throw hard. Um, you know, I can annotate that list too if you like, real quick. Uh, here are the guys that don't throw hard uh, this year. I'm gonna just do. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna just do qualified. Why not? I'm gonna do the bottom of the list. All right. So the bottom of the list is uh, Kenta Maeda, Tyler Anderson, Dane Dunning, Jose Quintana, Marco Gonzalez, Cody Bradford, Marcus Stroman, Dakota Hudson, and Aaron Nola, uh, Patrick Corbin. So, okay. Um, actually they're all healthy <laughs> and they've been fairly healthy. A lot of these guys, but Kenta Maeda had surgery. Um, and Marcus Stroman is, has struggled to stay on the field sometimes. Um, and, uh, also do you really want those players? Right. That's part of it. And Marco Gonzalez is hurt right now. He's got a forearm yeah. injury. So there you go. It, it's not like you completely avoid the injury problem and a, it's a smaller number, smaller percentage of players that are currently hurt working from the bottom of the leaderboard instead of from the top. So yeah, there's a difference, but the skills loss is so dramatic that naturally you're going to start saying, okay, maybe, maybe I want to live near the middle of the list, or maybe I only want to live near the top of the list when we're not talking about early round players, given the elevated risk, right? Then draft day price becomes part of the way you think about this. And 
it's not a particularly fun exercise because then you have this, well, this guy throws too hard. He's too good. I can't have him. <laughs> yeah. like, that's that's kind of dumb. Yeah, I don't want to go to that place. No, no, I really don't want to go there either. So I don't know, man. Like I, I think we've talked about how the injuries have typically jumped in the early part of the season. We're kind of in the thick of it right now. You know, once we go ahead and get to the second half of this season, if this is a typical year for injuries, we'll probably calm Slow down. down Cooler bit. heads will prevail and we'll think a little more about the pool the way we've always done it, or at least with a a slightly more calm sense about us when we're digging through it. Because right now the snap reaction is, oh, I had those guys and they all got hurt. I got five teams and I've got at least two of them on every team and I'm chasing pitching and the pitching on the wire is bad. It's a problem, but we're all dealing with it. And I think there's also this other funny thing that would happen if if somehow groupthink dictated that I don't want anyone to throw harder than 94, there'd be this weird premium on guys that throw like 93 and 94 because they're not <laughs> yeah, at the top just, and they're not at the bottom and they've got a lot of pitches. List. They've got command. Like, like which pitchers would become the, the really trendy pitchers that aren't quite the trendy pitchers of the, the current way. <laughs> Dean <everybody>. Kramer, 93, <laughs> nine. Woo. He's <laughs> right there. He's right there. Uh, Zach Eflin, SP one. That'd be the strategy. Like I want to wait. I'm going to wait for my SP one. I want a guy who doesn't throw hard. Who has a lot of pitches and good control. Like it's not a dumb idea. It's just not the best idea. And it doesn't always produce, you know, the very best players, you know. But the downside of those players is if they lose a tick, then they're in that danger zone. Then they're just like that first group of low velocity guys we were talking about that you don't necessarily want on your team. So we're living that for some players right now, too. So I don't know, man. Like, and then, Yes, by the way, I do know that Aaron Nola pitched one game in the cold, but I also know that Aaron Nola's fastball velocity was down before that game, so. Yeah, you were pretty clear about not really wanting Nola where he was going in most drafts on draft day. And to this point, you know, the K's are way down under 15% for the season. Swinging strikes also down 7% swinging strike rate for Aaron Nola. That'd be the lowest of his career. It's only yeah, 16 innings, like, but it's a pretty you get at 91, you know, pretty big drop off for him. Who's who's a real uh, the, the really exciting guys uh, do at least throw ninety one. Um, there you know you could you could build a, a roster with Aaron Zavali and Tanner Houck and Seth Lugo. Always Seth Lugo. I love you, Seth Lugo. Uh, <laughs> Logan Webb ninety two. Uh, you know, but you and Christian Javier ninety two. But even there, you're you're running into Joe Musgrove ninety two. Like sometimes velocity is relative to what the person has given you before. You know, Seth Lugo's 92 is a little different than Joe Musgrove's 92 because Joe Musgrove really did his best when he was 94. So what do you think the corrective action from a training perspective is it going to be? Is it going to be trying to push <laughs> your max up into the low triple digits, but then find a way to comfortably sit at 95, 96? So that way you're you're not top of the board, but you're not far from it. And I you're actually not have some hope for max. this. I have some hope for this because, you know, I've heard maxims like this. I've heard there are like, there are like quotes, there are like things that people say. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that people say is have 99 or have a hundred sit 96, yeah. you know, and, that's, that's and if the there's already like way. kind of a quote for it, then like, all right, let's do this. Yeah. Let's have, have a hundred in your back pocket, sit 96. That's a good, that's a good mantra because Glenn Fleisick would say, yeah, that's good. You're four miles an hour off. You're not. And then, you know, you can use your hundred like Verlander used to, right? Where yeah. you you have your ninety nine, your hundred in your back pocket when you you need an out. It seems like a good blueprint. I almost wonder if it's a lot harder to execute though than well than we think. I think I think a big part of it is that's why the Justin Verlander quote was so big. It was like Justin Verlander is like in the context of these harder balls and all these offensive rule changes. Like I just I'm fighting for, for my life every time I'm out there as a pitcher. I need to get every out I can get. And if you realize like these pitchers that are closing to their max, how many of them are just trying to make it as big leaguers? Like listen, listen to that list again. Jose Soriano. Please, I'm a starter. Please look at me. I can I can sit with high velo as a starter. Please give me a role. Joe Boyle, I want I'm a starter. Please, Ben Brown, please let me be a starter. Mackenzie Gore, like let me be a front end starter. You know, like I've been here, I've done some stuff, but I want to be a front end starter. 
Louis Varlin, I just need to make it. Yair Rodriguez, please let me be in the on the team. You know, Ryan Weathers, I've been struggling and I'm so much better now at 96. You're gonna tell me to dial it down to 95? I'm sorry, I'm not even sure I can be in the big leagues at 95. That's how like they've got to feel on some level. So it's not surprising to see you know a bunch of young players being like. You know, I'm throwing as hard as I can every time I'm out there. Yeah, and Weathers, even with that uptick in velocity, still has a K rate under 20%, still walking guys at a double-digit clip. It, it's fringy even with the velo for him. Of course he's going to throw as hard as he can every time because the, he's just got to prove that he's got some role in the big leagues. Even He'll take reliever at this point, probably. Right, it's about just not getting sent down, I think, if you're in a position like that. Um, speaking of Verlander, just going back to some news and notes here, he is tracking toward making his season debut Friday against the Nationals. So the wait really hasn't been too long. If you took the injury discount on Justin Verlander this draft season, the question just going to be, where's the stuff going to check in? Is he going to be the pre-2023 Verlander from the overall arsenal and, and velo perspective, or is what we saw last year probably a more fair place to put the expectations at this point? I'm just scanning. I was like, oh yeah, Verlander's coming back. <laughs> making sure he's not available in some leagues. Well, no, I've got I've actually been sitting on him in a couple of places. You go. Uh so Verlander at Washington versus Paul Blackburn at home against St. Louis. Yeah, yeah, the Paul Blackburn experience has been very positive to this point, but I think you would probably take the the right, shot on right, Verlander's right. season debut. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I I I I thought that Verlander was in that class of of, of players that, you know, was worth uh waiting for cuz the wait wouldn't be too long. Um, you know, I have another league where it's the choice of uh oh, Trevor Rogers at Chicago. Trevor Rogers got pushed because Edward Cabrera is up. Yeah, AJ Puck is sick. Edward Cabrera is back from the IL, and he's actually starting on Monday. So, thank you for helping me put Verlander in my lineups. <laughs> hey, I'm here to help. I think you know it's it, it's not without risk. Uh, Verlander at home against SF, uh, where he was supposed to. I mean, Rogers at home against SF was the, the choice before. He something happened in the schedule. Now he's at Chicago. That makes it the easier choice. If it was Trevor Rogers at home against SF versus Verlander's season debut against the Nationals, it might have been a closer decision just because Verlander is coming back off of injury. He hasn't had the most amazing uh, rehab in terms of results. Um, what did he do? He had a ERA over 10, you know. Uh, he did strike people out, though, and I do expect him to strike f more people out this year than 21%. He had such a long career of, you know, like seven years in a row of striking out closer to 30%. So I'm expecting more strikeouts this year. Maybe he'll be on the upper end of his home run issues because he's just getting older. Uh, but give me a more than a strikeout per inning um and an era under four pretty comfortably yeah that'll play uh not just verlander getting ready for his season debut this week looks like jordan montgomery is going to go friday as well It'll be on the road against the giants kind of was at a good time for the d-backs edward rodriguez was already hurt had a setback last week dealing with some shoulder tightness so uh, to get there late Spring addition in the rotation is a good boost for them. I think Montgomery actually had a pretty rough outing at uh, AAA Reno, but it's like, how do you how do you build up? How do you rehab? How do you do that stuff in the PC? I wonder if he had the um, if he had ABS because yeah. his strike his his walk rate is the thing that really struggled. Yeah, yeah, good question. I think ABS is a problem, man. I, I I understand wanting to you know get things correct and being precise, but like we've seen walk rates explode, and I don't really want that for myself at the major leagues. Like I watch enough little league with all those walks. I don't. <laughs> I, I like what if the the major league walk rate went to like fourteen percent? Don't you think it would make watching baseball less fun? They could make the games take longer, and I think that's uh, counter to what the league's been trying to do with all of its effort at the pitch clock and disengagement rules, so it'd be a big step in the wrong direction. I mean, yes, in theory, I definitely want automated balls and strikes. I love the system that they use where you can make a challenge, they put the strike or the pitch up on the board, you get the ball strike call, the crowd can react. I feel like it's quick, it makes sense, we want to get 
borderline difficult calls right. And I say this as someone who thinks being an umpire is really hard. Plus, if you've read any of the recent stories about it lately, umpires are getting collectively better. It's just that Angel Hernandez is still bad. <laughs> out there just making them all just look bad. Pulling them back down. Just <laughs> like umpires soaring to new heights. Angel <laughs> Hernandez. Yoink, just pull them down. <laughs> nope. Nope. We're not going up there. We're not going to a new level. We're staying right down here. Yeah. It's I just one know. of those goofy things, man. Like it. If I, I think th- they there's the listen, there's an actual kind of serious problem with Angel Hernandez, which is like he's sued the league and like right. he's accused them of discrimination. And so I think it, it's hard for them to like fire him, even though it just seems like he's bad at the job. I don't really know why he still wants to do the job at this stage. You know, like, do you think it's fun to be Angel Hernandez? Like, I <laughs> don't think it'd be fun at all. I still remember there's an old clip from sometime in the 90s where there was an amazingly bad strike zone at a minor league game. And sure enough, Angel Hernandez. <laughs> it was <him. laughs> it was an old little press clipping that made the rounds like, wow, this has been going on for a long time. And it <laughs> happened even before the big league level. It's like, hey, he, he made it. But um, I just I hope I hope for the sake of all of us, he just says, you know, I've had enough, enough calling games. I'd like to. I'd like to ride off into the sunset. That'd be that'd be great for everybody involved. Uh, Jordan Romano coming back this week. Hopefully, uh, you got him activated where you can. You know, probably going to be early in the week. So good news there. Christian, Ooh, that Yelich. does help me make a decision somewhere else. Actually, yeah, I'm just helping uh, Eno right now. Yeah, we're just we're just we're just following along as Eno sets his lineups. Is what we're doing. <laughs> um, no, but this one might be interesting to people. I have a choice between Chad Green um, and Ben Brown. And Ben Brown right now is scheduled for a two-step um, against Miami and Arizona, which mm. seems like a good one. And we had been dilly-dallying because we're just not sure that Ben Brown is going to get the second start because Jameson Tyon's on his way back. But if you kind of rank the pitchers on the uh, Cubs uh, that are healthy right now, I think Ben Brown is in the top five. I mean, the question is basically, uh, you've got Shota, uh, Tyon, Assad, and Hendricks, I think, are in the top four. Um, and then the question will be between Wicks and Ben Brown. Mm. I kind of like Ben Brown. I think Wicks is a little bit ahead in the natural pecking order. He's had more chances at starting. But if Ben Brown is pitching well and Wicks is not really getting the results... I think you're still a couple of weeks away from Justin Steele coming back. So you do have a little, little bit of a window here to see what Ben Brown can give you. Uh, I do like him better than Wicks also. So I think they that's could put move Brown and Wicks on the same day, maybe. They could just to have some options. Uh, and mm-hmm. I think the other way to look at it, too, is even if Ben Brown loses the two step, those are both good enough matchups where you're not you're not totally ruined. Right. As long as he gets mm-hmm. one of those starts, it's probably well, as the good Romano as Chad news Green just came down and made it easier to take Chad Green out. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I'd, I would go the route of Ben Brown in that situation as well. Uh, a couple position players that are, are banged up. Carlos Correa is on the IL with a mild intercostal strain, and now Christian Yelich may need an IL stint. He missed the final two games of the series against the Orioles after leaving Friday night's game early with a back issue. And it's been kind of an on again, off again problem for Yelich in recent years. You get the sense that since it's April, if they think it needs a brief IL stint, they'd rather just nip it in the bud and try to put it behind him as opposed to playing with a slightly shorthanded roster in the next couple days. Yeah, it's 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 always hard to to make these decisions on someone who's like, you know, hurt but maybe not super hurt. I mean, I think I think of also like Framber Valdez and uh Bobby Miller where they're like, well, we think it'll be 2 weeks or so. And then you just got to I hope it is. The early numbers from Yelich, by the way, include a 51.6% pull rate. You may have noticed he's actually pulled a few home runs. When Kirsten Yelich starts pulling barrels, good things tend to happen. So it'd be a shame if this injury cost him more than a little bit of time. The we'll Correa one is 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 annoying to me just personally because he stepped in for story in one league. And now I'm oh. like, 
Now I'm all, it's a draft and hold, so I'm all the way down to Daryl or nice. <laughs> yeah, where I wanted to be. Well, and Correa's start to the season has been pretty good as well. Average OBP, nice and high. Only one homer through 11 games, but just kind of looked like he was back in some sense of the word through the first few weeks. So I wonder uh, if abductor intercostal oblique strains are the elbow injuries of hitters. I mean, the there is a corollary to fastball velo being important, which is bat speed is important. Mm. And, uh, you know, obliques are kind of, a, you know, trunk rotation is a big part of pitch velocity, but also uh, bat speed. So. We've seen, and then it seems like we get these. I, I, I don't know that we get these more, uh, but it seems definitely that we get more uh, oblique strains early in the season. Yeah, I mean, it's just the ramping all the way back up. Even though you have spring training, it's still different to go at game speed than it is to train throughout the winter. So I think that's a, a good thing to to point out. This time of year seems to be more, more of a, I don't know, conducive i guess to the problem in temperatures too right you've got a lot yeah, of cold weather games this yeah. time of year that's always part of the story we're talking about baseball and in, in march he doesn't have a history of these though right this is kind of a you know he's his him and foot injuries and, and Korea had like a rib problem from a massage or something oh that's right yeah crack ago, so, rib or something. yeah i don't know if this is in any way long term related to that but I mean, at least it's not his foot ankle like nothing down there with right, the hardware yeah. so i guess that's good uh, you know, I think he's, you know, he's probably a guy that you had mostly in deep league. So I guess I would hold, but you know, oblique league, obliques are one of those things that could be a month. Yeah. And he's popped up. Correa has popped up on a few different lists of players that were actually dropped in some 12 team leagues over the weekend, which I thought was kind of interesting. I mean, do you think coming off of the year he just had in 2023 where the power really dipped. I mean, a 399 slugging percentage from, from Carlos Correa is, is a concern. Uh, even though the underlying numbers, the hard hit rate, 45.9%, barrel rate was still 9.6%, would lead you to believe there's still better power than that in his bat. Do you think he's really fallen as much as the redraft market knocked him down? He was a outside the top 200 pick in just about every league I saw uh, back in the winter and spring. Like his is this what Carlos Correa is now? Even in keeper and dynasty leagues, has just a, a lot of luster worn off to the point where he's actually a player that can be reasonably dropped in shallow leagues when he's not playing? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, it's just, I think the ceiling is, it's just not as exciting as you're going to have with other players you could pick up. Like, think of even just someone, Jordan Westbrook, somebody we, that we've talked about, we like, you know. Yeah, he was available in a few of my 12s. I was excited to pick him up. And he's stealing bases, you know, like what is the absolute ceiling on Westbrook for this year? It probably looks a little bit like Correa plus stolen bases. Yeah. You know? that's fair. Which, and Correa's just not going to steal those bases for you anymore. So, you know, I think he is kind of a use him when you've got him. And the reason why his, his price was so cheap in, in uh, 15 teamers and deeper leagues was just that you, this, this seemed inevitable that he would be hurt on some level. Yeah, I guess a player that doesn't run in an environment where bags are basically free, it's even more problematic. There's, there's even more ground to make up. We've talked before about how you generally want to get speed from the middle infield. And if you're not getting elite batting average like you do from Corey Seager, then you have a really difficult player to roster. There's a couple things you have to do in a build to justify having Correa on a roster. I'm looking back at 2022 in the auction calculator. He was a $12 player. In a 12 team league, is that the ceiling now? I mean, probably. And I guess when a $12 player gets hurt in a 12 team league, it depends on what the rest of your roster looks like. If you can actually see them through, he's not a player you'd look at as a must keep and a keep five or even a keep seven scenario because you got to be a top 100 guy, even a top yeah. 60 sort of guy in a, in a league like that. And Carlos Correa is not that guy anymore, even if he's still a solid player. Well, you you know, like you were right to point out that like since it's such a stolen base rich environment, your expected number of stolen bases per roster slot goes up. And so any zero you take becomes more painful because you were expected to get this many. And so I just did the quick math and given the sort of 180 stolen bases that was kind of a target for me in these 15 teamers going in uh, and with uh, free agency, uh, like the main event. 
those uh, teams I wanted 180. You got 14 roster slots, but you also have two catcher slots. So you're kind of baking in at least one zero up there. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing that, then you want to have basically 15 stolen bases per roster slot. So having Correa means you need to pick up 50, you need to have a 30 somewhere. And that's just to keep serve, basically. Yeah. Yeah, it makes things really, really difficult when you build that way. Uh, we've got a couple notes in our Discord from the reverse mailbag version of this question. Uh, big Prince fan on our Discord. I would die for you. Why you, you Darvish? Uh, who are guys you shouldn't quite drop yet? That's what sort of inspired this segment. They've had a tough shake in their first three starts, but there's cause for optimism. So some of the pitchers that were thrown in there, Michael King, Hunter Brown, who got just rocked by the Royals last time out. Brandon Fott was a popular answer from a few folks in the Discord. He was cut in a lot of leagues. Christopher Sanchez. Let's just start with those four because I feel like by price, you're looking at guys that were in that pick 125 to maybe 200 range. And you know, King especially was very trendy throughout draft season. As soon as he ended up in San Diego, there was a lot of excitement about him getting to be a full-time starter, especially in that ballpark. What have you seen from Michael King so far? I mean, how much of it is schedule related how much of it is having to ramp up early for that opening series in korea like do you, do you try to give him a pass because my my snap reaction is this type of player especially someone you drafted that early but really this type of player if you believe in him is the reason you have a few bench spots like you shouldn't go from i think he's my third or fourth best pitcher to he shouldn't be on my roster that seems like too much of an overcorrection based on a bumpy uh, bumpy run through these first four outings yeah, I guess the, the thing that's worrisome is just that the velo is down. It's it's creeping up a little bit by game, um, but I don't think he's going to be sitting 95 plus this year at any point. Um, and I think what that has done is made him more vulnerable against lefties. That's what I've seen when I've watched. If you think about it, uh, if you have a great sinker and a sweeper, and then a, a, a four seam fastball that's 95 or 96, and that drops down to 93. Um, then uh, you could see that the four seam might get hurt. You might still be able to dominate righty. So his right line against righty is 171 average, 190 OBP, 463 slugging. Uh, there are some homers in there, but overall that's a 278 woba. That's fine. That's that's good. He's been doing good against righties. Against lefties, 265, 457, 500 slugging, 428 woba. Uh, they have been doing a great job against him and it's supported by weird peripherals, 13% strikeout rate against lefties, 26% walk rate for Michael King. So it's basically all in that four seam. That's not as good as it was with the, the missing velo. So he's nibbling against lefties. I don't know. I guess in a 10 team, I could see it. You know, in a 12 team, I'm trying to hold in a 15 team. He's on my bench this week. Um, and and I and I agree with you generally that, you know, I would like to hold a little bit longer, especially since the game by game results have been up and down. Um, I feel like, you know, you still got a shot. And, and as bad as his walk rate was against the Giants, you would play him for those 11 innings. You would have given up. He gave up two runs and giving you 10 strikeouts in those 11 innings. So if you play the, you know, play him against the Giants and not the Dodgers game, uh, right now you're still doing fine. Mm -hmm. So I think I would just downgrade Michael King into uh, a hold, but someone that you uh, are more careful with in terms of starts. And yeah, so maybe sweet. the 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 initial of the initial draft price would have led you to say he's in all the time. That's mm -hmm. probably not quite the right usage with that downturn in Velo. I wonder if that's going to be Milwaukee. I'm choosing Keaton Wynn at Miami over him at Milwaukee. I'm choosing Dean Kramer at Kansas City over him. Oh, that, that's that's a little spicy. I want to give Michael King uh, a go at like a medium offense. You know, like I feel like Giants, they go, they'll score some runs, but Giants, I would have been. That's like, oh, I'll play him. Dodgers is like, oh, I won't play him. Milwaukee is somewhere in between. I kind of want to see where that in between is <laughs> with him on the bench. You know what I mean? Good chance that Yelich isn't playing in that game, though. He's their most dangerous. Oh, are you convincing bat. me to to over to over Dean Kramer. Kramer? I think I think King over Dean Kramer is something I'd probably do. 
right. it's close, but I think I'd go king. I'll think about it. It's, it's it's so much easier to make that call when it's not your roster. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I would definitely do that. If I were staring it down myself, I'd probably have uh, more nerves about it to say the to say the least. But what do you think? And I've, and I've got this thing where usually I'm like last year I was fighting, uh, you know, to get back in uh, all year. And there's something that's interesting when you have this fighting energy when you're lower in the table. You're kind of be like, oh, you can also do more fun things where you're like. Uh, I'm not worried about ERA. It's it's already going so badly. I'm just gonna you know try to get strikeouts and wins, right? You can make those decisions, and then you can make some real heyday by like sort of advancing in the places and and giving up on something. But when you're in first, I'm in like right now. I'm in like first or second in most of my leagues, and it's like I don't want to give up anything. I want to be good at everything. You know? <laughs> you're playing tight. You get the lead, but it's it's making you. Like, you which nervous. one of those two is more likely to blow up? Maybe Kramer. Probably Kramer. I mean, Kramer so far this season, his first three starts has been getting hit in the zone a lot. Almost 95% for a zone contact percentage. Lower K rate potential than King anyway. Royals yeah. have been playing pretty well. That's kind of what I'm thinking. It's like you know, the Brewers offense looks good too, but I think without Yelich especially, I think the Royals might be just as dangerous. I think you're starting at a lower baseline of skills for Dean Kramer too. So that's what, so that's what makes me nervous. Too much time spent on my teams. <laughs> yeah. But, a lot of but I do think these are like the things that people were thinking about. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, what were the other names? I mean, I think fought, I think is a little bit easier to, to drop. I saw him on there, but you, you give me, uh, you give me, you give me names that weren't fought yet. Who Hunter you? Brown was on there. I mean, yeah. Hunter Brown is a really tough one. I mean, the model still says that like, I mean, the, the one thing that I was surprised by the model says his fastball is worse this year than last year. Hmm. And, and significantly so. So he no longer has a plus fastball by stuff plus. And so now, you know, if that's true, you're putting Hunter Brown in a class of players that like has three good breaking balls and an iffy fastball. You know who does who's like a person like that? Javier Assad. Mm. So, so you've, yeah, you've lowered to waiver wire skills by that measure, at least. Right. So if you want to drop him, drop him. I think just go with your gut you know if that's if that's how you feel i still think there's some upside here i think in keeper leagues i'm i'm holding on my bench as much as long as long as i can in 15 plus i'd rather prefer to hold him if he gets dropped a bunch you know uh, this is jumping ahead to little some where the money went a little bit but like for example this week i spent a dollar on ryan feltner in the main event Ryan Feltner like has always had good stuff numbers and then but he's a he's still a Rocky so it's not something I would ever want to start at home it's just a toe in the water I if Hunter Brown was dropped if Hunter Brown had been an option instead of Ryan Feltner and he might be next week I forgot to look at the drops um I might do the same thing two three dollar pick up toe in the water stash him see what's going on yeah I, I think there's still despite the slow start a lot to like with the team context Astros are still going to win plenty of games. They have a great bullpen. They have a lineup that's going to score runs. I think because of the way they're built, they need to get Hunter Brown right. So even if he were to get demoted, I don't think he's necessarily a you know four plus week demotion candidate. It'd be more like two or three starts, get the confidence back, get the fastball back in particular. I'd be more on the side of holding if possible, and then certainly trying to pick him up and stash him. Uh, if he's available in your league, you know, Brandon fought. Why, why is fought an easy cut for you? We talked a lot in the winter about how he made some adjustments late last season. We saw it through the postseason, 23% K rate early on 4% walk rate. So the surface numbers look pretty good. You know, home runs are still a little bit of a problem for him, but at a quick glance, I actually think fought's a great trade target. If you're in a league where someone's a little bit jumpy and doesn't want to have, have them going. Yeah, I just, uh, the one thing that was uh, like the sinker does not fix that we even saw in the playoffs is that he's really tentative against lefties. Mm -hmm. And again, lefties are hitting 310, 344, 552 against him. You know, it's a little bit early to like write any of these splits down in stone, obviously. But I will say that splits for pitchers become like lefty righty splits for pitchers become meaningful quicker than they do for hitters and that's because they have a certain type they have pitches you know what i mean and the pitches themselves have 
platoon splits, you know? So, you know, he may not just have, he may not have a great arsenal for getting lefties out. Uh, right now, the sinker is a 96 stuff plus. The four seam is 69. Um, and the changeup is below 100. So his best pitches right now are sinker, sweeper. He's in that class. Hmm. You know, he's a sinker, sweeper guy looking for ways to get lefties out. And um, as far as we've advanced as a culture, we're still uh, talking about Justin Masterson types. <laughs> really? We think that we've figured it out. How can we make a sinker slider guy work? We give him just enough of a four scene. We give him a cutter. You know, um, we give him a gyro slider. Hmm. I don't know, man. I think I think Fott's showing us something with the control. Like the fact that the walk rate's down mm -hmm. is a really good early sign from him. I think it's going to be okay for Fott. I, I do think the problem against lefties is going to be there, so maybe you have to look at some of the more dangerous lefty-heavy lineups and consider it more of a, a matchup play where you take him out for those. consider that he might give up homers. Like the bat says he's going to give up 1.6 homers going forward. But if he keeps the walk rate even... Even close to, I mean, last year, 6.2%. That's for the entire season. 96 mm -hmm. innings with 6% no, AAA. He's got a good command, and that's that's always going to speak in his favor. Right. So maybe the maybe the thing that's changed for Brandon Fott is if you previously thought the ceiling was that of a guy that could be an SP2, if it all clicked, maybe that's starting to fade a little bit. But I think this is just a slow start. A couple of tough matchups sprinkled in there as well. Uh, he'd be a target for me in shallow leagues where someone else let him go. Some of the other names are for deeper leagues. Um, DL Hall, I, his fastball just looks horrible. His secondary stuff looks okay. Had a funny sequence. He was ahead 0 2 on Anthony Santander facing his former team this weekend. Hit him in the back foot with a pitch and then give up a homer to the next batter. So that was kind of a funny like sequence that he was one pitch away from getting out of it. And stuff plus that happened. he doesn't have a pitch over 100. Yeah. And, I, I, and says the four seam is really bad. Probably going back to the bullpen at some point once the Brewers have the depth to pull it off. So I totally understand. I cut DL Hall in a few different leagues. He's got to be like 15 team leagues and deeper, probably for me to even have him on a roster right now. I mean, he'd be a streamer. He'd be in that bucket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. AJ Puck with the early struggles. Did, have you given up on Puck yet? Yeah. Model didn't never really like him, even when the spring numbers were great as far as the results went. So I could see could see that being someone you were you're quick to uh, to move on from. Uh, Matt Manning is in here. He's made a couple of starts as the that extra one is starter. really hard for me because I liked him. I've got a bunch of draft and holds where it's irrelevant, um, mm -hmm. and I think he is the sixth starter there. Mm -hmm. The model is just kind of like he's pretty good, but like my eye test, I feel like I like him better than my model does. Mm -hmm. um, and he's the results have pretty much always been there. You know, not in terms of strikeouts necessarily, but you know, a four three zero uh, one two four a whip for Matt Manning for his career in two hundred thirty eight innings. Like he's a decent major league pitcher, um, but I guess I would focus on the word decent and you know think about what leagues you want a decent major league pitcher and how long you would wait around for a decent major league pitcher. I don't necessarily think he has the upside of. Uh, SB one through three, really, in most fancy leagues. So, but I would say, you know, because the results, especially since 2022, I mean, this, this debut season in 2021 is when a lot of the, the ratio damage was kind of baked mm -hmm. into those overall numbers, which really aren't bad. I think you could look at him kind of in a similar light to a Miles Michaelis, but with an up arrow next to his name because he's 26. He could still get better. And even if he's not an SP one, two, or three, as we're learning, the SP four, five, and six group is really wobbly so if we think he can get into that group that's good enough to hold on to i think a 12 team league's really tough when he's not on the roster though because yeah. the ceiling's not that high a 15 yeah. is kind of like my team's healthy and i'm not stashing anybody else and i think someone in that tiger's rotation is going to break that'd be your thinking if you're going to stash him so i i see the case for having to cut him and then trying to bid on him later once is the opportunity comes back around he is squarely in a class of pitchers that I find more interesting in draft and hold. And then I have to remember when draft and hold season ends that like to like them less. Because <laughs> mm. the reason why you love Miles Michaelis and Matt Manning in draft and holds is, you know, even in their worst seasons, they're going to have a good, you know, a good week that 
they're going to play. They, they may actually have lower injury history, you know, lower injury risk because they don't throw as hard, you know, uh, in that context. But they're also just uh, parts of major league uh, one through sixes, you know, major league rotations. And uh, they're not exciting to anybody else. And what I find in, in these leagues where draft and hold means you can't pick up anybody the rest of the season, you know, what I find is that people switch too early to picking up prospects and they want to take pitchers with high ceiling. And I'm like, well, let me, while you're doing that, let me gobble up all these boring arms so that I have options when people get hurt as opposed to, oh, my stars got hurt. Now I have prospects who are not in the major leagues. Oops. You know, so... That's that's why I'm I'm happy with the Matt Mannings I have. I'm not looking to necessarily acquire a lot more Matt Mannings, and I could see people dropping him in shallower leagues for sure. Sticking with the Tigers, one more surprising drop. Spencer Torkelson cut in some shallow leagues, still looking that's for his first point. barrel of the season. 15 games in, 222, 279, 302 in the very small sample. Striking out less, but also walking less. Chasing pitches outside the zone a little bit more just a blip or actually a reason to be concerned about torque i'm a hold i'm gonna acquire i'm gonna i'm going to stay in on this i like the new swing and strike rate and strikeout rate i like that and it comes in with a big pull rate so right now he's pulling fly balls and making more contact like on a process level he's doing all the right things except for maybe chasing a little bit more and the chasing a little bit more is not like oh now he's chasing 50 percent of the time so, um, yes, the hard hit rate is down. There's some signs that aren't good, but I think in terms of process, I'm still in on him. Yeah, I, I think there's still plenty to like with Torkelson. And that league was a keeper league. That was from Jeff Good, low guppy, saying he was dropped in a league. Keep a uh, limited number of players, not a keep everyone scenario. But I, I mean, I think he could hook. play his way into a, a, like a keep six or eight or whatever, you know, like keep 10, you know, like. Yeah, I mean, power, speed is abundant. Power is a little harder to come by. And oh. if we get a little more from Torque, you never know. That was a general question I saw somewhere. I, You know, we get a lot of questions a lot of different places. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm sorry that I can't uh, attach it to the person who asked it. But there was, you know, people asking about people that have established power, uh, you know, in their past, but are having trouble with power in the early season. And I would just tell you uh, to really wait on that, you know. Torkelson's a little bit more annoying because he hasn't hit his max EV and his hard hit rates aren't aren't good. But I would say that one of the noisiest things out there is power because he could have a two homer game tomorrow and most of his numbers would start to look normal. I was just uh, looking at this this custom date range uh, thing from last season on fan graphs, just trying to say, okay, what, what happened at the beginning of the season last year? We're quick to forget. It right. happens. Uh, you know, you look at, at some of the guys that go into a beginning of a season and show no power. It, it's happened. It happens to everybody at some point. You just get off to a slow start. It's cold. Again, it's cold. Play a lot of games not quite right or something. A couple yeah. tough matchups. It, it, it don't, don't just write players off because of who that. do you have in that on your, on your leaderboard from last year? I switched from pitchers to hitters just to make. I'm just going to make sure it's actually running properly real quick before I read the names because I'm looking at the names. I'm like, wait a minute. These are some of the same guys that are struggling right now. Here we go. Here's last year's list. Uh, Wilson Contreras at this time last year was no homers. He ended up being fine. Uh, Let's see. Eric Hosmer, not good. Justin Turner, he ended up having a good year. Yeah. Gene Segura, Donovan Solano, and I'm looking for power for them anyway. Nick Castellanos had zero through 15 games last year. What did he finish with? 25 29 29 yeah so i mean 15 games don't mean a whole lot there are some names on here that didn't ever figure it out tim anderson being among them yeah, but turner, again it's like what were you expecting trey turner was, turner a, zero. was a little bit down took up a few months but he got going he got back to where he, he should go he got to enough power yeah jose abreu was a zero this time last year and what's interesting about that one is that we I thought he was toast last year and then he had you know a little bit of resurgence, but you you know, like he is one of like four players that his age or older that was as bad as he was in the first half that had okay second halves. Like really you have like five hundred people like him, and he was one of four that was like, Oh, I'm above average in the second half. And I just feel like 
asking him to do that again would be a bad idea. Here's another, here's a strange one. Lane Thomas, who had a great season last year. Mm, that is so good power. because Lane Thomas is maybe acquirable right now. He's someone that you could maybe go and get in, in leagues uh, because the batting average is down. The, the, the homers aren't great. Um, Jeez, if that, he's got seven steals already. Yes. Though. If the other team has a steals need, they won't give him to you. But, um, you know, he, I think he's borderline acquirable. If the other team had a bunch of steals elsewhere and they feel like maybe this is a paper tiger situation, uh, you know, then they might trade him. He's also, you know, he's 28. He's never was a big prospect. So, you know, it, it, it's right in the line of like good enough to want to acquire and bad enough of so a start that you can maybe get him. Um, and the nice thing is uh, I did talk to him about those, st the stolen bases and it's, like he's like it's a combination of the team uh just being like you you can go like you can go on your own if you want like there's there's like a green light we give you and then there's like uh your first base coach will turn to you and be like you know you don't really technically have the green light but this is not a bad spot to go mm. so uh they are they are pro stolen bases in washington and i expect that uh he will have at least i would say like 35 stolen bases this year yeah, I mean, great start for Lane Thomas. And as we saw, power was quiet early on last season, came on just fine as the weather warmed up. So it's just a, it's an okay exercise to use if you're trying to calm yourself down about players that are underperforming. Let's get to a few uh, sources of where the money went over the weekend for fab bids. Colton Kowser in 12-team leagues was the big player to get, or maybe some deeper leagues he was out there, but mostly 12s. He was on fire this past week, too. We talked about it going into the weekend. Certainly looks like a guy that could be an impact player going forward in 12 teamers if they're willing to you know, back off the playing time for guys like Austin Hayes. Yeah. And what we saw since we talked was he played all weekend. Yeah. <laughs> and hitting. it'll happen. One thing that uh, I saw that was a little bit interesting, a little bit upsetting to me because I have a, a fair amount of Cedric Mullins shares is that one day uh, against lefties, he played over Mullins in center. Uh, at least Mullins got back in the game and got a hit. Um, and uh, I do think that they prefer Mullins defense in center. So they started against the left-handed starting pitcher. They put him in center and then they moved him off of center once the lefty was out of the game. So Mullins is a little bit more risky than I want him to be, but that means that Kowser is a little bit safer uh, than I first expected because there's going to be some starts in center against lefties. Nice early rumblings getting that chance against the lefty. He's got a couple steals to go with the four homers as well, but one of the hottest hitters in the league right now. Not a surprise that he was getting triple-digit bids across the board in the Rotowire Online Championship. A uh, player that I didn't go after anywhere that uh, some people I trust were going after, Kirby Yates. Are you trusting Kirby Yates to be the capital C closer for the Rangers? I am not really, and... Um, one of my, one of the things that I, I expect to be true, which I have not proven yet is that fastball stuff plus is, is over of oversized importance for the closer role as, a, as opposed to relievers. And I think that Kirby Yates can be a good reliever with the stuff he has right now, but he has a sub not, he has a 90 uh, fastball stuff plus, And I just feel like that makes him more of a Luke Gregors and Sergio Romo type, mm. which were good relievers that never really, they closed very rarely. And I think it's because they're kind of crafty and they have a really good secondary. Kirby Yates' splitter is very good and his slider is pretty good too. But in the closer role, sometimes you need them to just blow it by them. The, you know, there's just, there's, that's the ninth inning. You need to have a good fastball. And so um, LeClerc's got the best fastball stuff plus in that bullpen. And his manager said recently, it's not, not LeClerc. <laughs> So, um, so strange. yeah, I don't know the, the things that we have to kind of read between the lines on, but, um, LeClerc may not have lost his job yet. Kirby Yates doesn't even have a save yet. Um, and so I'm not, uh, I'm not, I, I, in my leagues, I put like a make good, uh, bid on him, but, uh, I put the similar bid on Jeff Hoffman and I totally expected to, uh, win Jeff Hoffman. 
uh, given the same bids on both of the players, and that's what happened. So we put $30 on Yates and $30 on uh, Jeff Hoffman, and we won Jeff Hoffman, and I'm more excited about that because I think Jeff Hoffman is a better pitcher. It's a slightly more crowded situation that he finds himself in in the um, in the Phillies bullpen. But in terms of fastball stuff plus, it is him um, and Sir Anthony Dominguez and Orion Kirkering. I don't think, you know, Orion just coming off of the, the IL and being as young as he is, I don't think it's going to go to Orion right away. Um, and Sir Anthony is, is pretty wild, you know, and he, and he, you know, he's up and down and he's, you know, they have, they've given him 11 saves in the last three years. So I, I, I just, I just feel like Hoffman could actually just take this and run with it. Yeah, I I would agree with that assessment. More crowded, but better baseline skills. Most specifically, I'm just worried that Kirby Yates is going to walk a lot of guys. I think that's, if you don't have a great fastball and you're going to walk guys in the ninth inning, you're not going to be in the ninth inning very long. He's 37 years old at this stage of his career. I just, I think he's more of a sixth or seventh inning guy being miscast in that extra high leverage situation Agreed. for the Rangers. Uh, one other pitcher I wanted to ask you about before we go, Jose Budo gets picked up in a bunch of 12 team leagues and some deeper ones where he's available. He gets the Dodgers this week though. And I found it really difficult in most situations to pick up a pitcher that I wasn't going to use this week when even the schedule beyond this week is somewhat difficult for him, but the numbers they're trending in the right direction. Buddha looks like he might have an opportunity to make an impact in a Mets rotation that needs a couple guys to step up. Yeah, I'm really surprised by a 34% strikeout rate. I mean, he peaked at 27 and 28 in the minors. Um, so I think that's a little bit uh, untrue. One thing that's interesting is that Stuff Plus may undervalue him because his changeup is a legit pitch. And I don't know why it's showing as a 59 Stuff Plus. So hmm. if you, I think it's, it's, it's useful to like look at a person's stuff plus pitch by pitch because uh, for, first of all, like the different pitches uh, stabilize faster. So if you're looking at a, a guy's breakdown by pitch type, you can look at the fastballs and the slider and say, those are ahead of the other pitches uh, in terms of stabilization. And what I see is a guy with a 98 stuff plus sinker. That's actually well above average for sinkers and a one Oh two stuff plus slider. That's good. So that's a foundation. And then he's got this changeup that has been working and it, the model doesn't like. So I think I like him better than the model does, um, but the schedule uh, wasn't super useful for me. Um, uh, the, a, a person that uh, you know may have uh, the green light to be in a ro- rotation for a little bit that also got some big deals was Yariel Rodriguez. Mm-hmm. He got some $100 bids. Um, his four seam is better than Budo's. Uh, his slider is better than Budo's, and um, I think that's a, a surprisingly good foundation. Um, I, It's a cut-ride four-seamer for Yari Rodriguez and a sweeper. Um, that's a really interesting combination. You know who throws that? Justin Steele. Mm. So a little bit of righty Justin Steele action here, um, and more pitches than Justin Steele. So I, I think Yari Rodriguez is someone to pick up. Yeah, and uh, Rodriguez uh, make, makes the stuff look different too. Like it, it's you could kind of see from some of the clips from that first outing. Like it's not every fastball he throws doesn't look the same. Yeah, that's that cut four seam, and then he's got the sinker. And I bet you he probably has like a regular four seam that he like plays around with. Mm-hmm. He seems like a guy that's like, um, it's not El Duque necessarily just because he's Cuban, but like you know has that kind of like I've got a lot of pitches, man, and I'm gonna. I'm gonna play around with these. I'm gonna I'm gonna have some feel on these pitches. So uh, that's the that's the vibe I got from him. Um, you know, otherwise uh, we spent some money on like stashing Ryan Feltner, who's uh, you know always the models always liked him, but he's um, you know a Colorado pitcher. Uh, I also stashed Wade Miley. If people want to look <laughs> ahead a week. Uh, he's got the Pirates and the Yankees and then a two-step next week. And I just had a whole long conversation with Jesse Winker about um, how smart Wade Miley is and how good he is at um, at getting the most out of what he has. Um, so, you know, that's... Uh, and then I got a, a Trevor Rogers for 20 bucks. I got him back. I, 
I think well, he's the possibility when you cut someone, you could scoop them back up later. I just got him right back, and it wasn't actually that expensive. I also think that Rodgers is like a, a good 15 team guy to be like, he's on your bench, he's in the lineup, he's on your bench, he's, he's a Marlins pitcher. He's a Marlins pitcher that you want to pitch in Miami, and that's about it. Yeah, home streaming built in. Funny you mentioned Jesse Winker, too. It seems like he's healthy again, finally, after two years of not being healthy between Seattle and Milwaukee. Uh, one of the leagues I picked him up, Spencer Strider was the drop. That felt oh, awful. I was like, oh, let me take a flyer on Jesse Winker, who I liked last year and was seemingly broken all year. I missed out on Jesse Winker. We bid $2. And one other person bid six dollars, and the winner got him for twelve dollars. This is out of a thousand, so uh, this is really low stakes fighting over Jesse Winker, uh, just to give you an idea of where uh, he's useful. But the strikeout rate is back to where it was when he was good. Um, you know, he, the hard hit numbers aren't aren't great, so I expect him uh, to be kind of like maybe a fifteen homer guy. But the playing time is there; they're for playing sure. him. He's going to yeah. play. He's going to drive a lot of runs. They're rebuilding in a way that's at least sustainable to the guys that play. It's not quite like a White Sox A's situation where you look at it and go, oh, this is this is so bad. It's going to actually hurt the guys that are high volume players. I don't think that's the case at all. So, yeah, I was well, the, like yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, because obviously James Wood and uh, and Dylan Cruz are the people that are coming for Jesse Winker's job. You know, when they pull that the when they pull that switch is going to be a big deal so you know obviously don't invest heavily because that might happen at any time james wood 19 percent k rate triple a right now 20 percent walk rate too you know abs triple a what can you do <laughs> yeah, but, he but is two homers breaking. five steals doing everything he can to uh to push his way onto that roster in uh, dc that is going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. On our way out the door, a reminder, you can get a subscription at theathletic.com slash Rates and Barrels. Find Eno on Twitter at Eno Saris. Find me at Derek Van Riper. Find the podcast at Rates and Barrels. We're back with you on Tuesday. Thanks for listening.